very, very much, Simon. That's very long. <laughs> well, it's lovely to be here. Um, and the room is very wide. <laughs> Crossbill, shrike, and even 
bobo to learn, learn, learn. Um, so when I was at school, um, I had elocution lessons. I don't know if some of you are of my generation when we had such things. Um, anyway, they weren't to um, teach you to speak properly or anything. They were more like drama, really. And uh, you were given a text and you had to learn it by heart and then you recite it. And um, my elocution mistress, I adored her. Miss Edgerton Smith, Miss Muriel Edgerton Smith, Eggy for short, <laughs> elocution. She sat behind the door, squat as a toad in a twig set of tweeds, my oracle. How are the mighty fallen, I intoned, as light poured in, in the midst of the battle. Oh, Jonathan, I moaned, and through the pain, sun shone as though over a sunburst window, flooding rays into my soul. Thou was slain. Who Jonathan was? Oh, no. I was Jonathan. The light and the sun were Jonathan. My elocution mistress, my first beloved, you were Jonathan. And thy love to me was wonderful. Yes, it was, it was. Passing the love of women, women and men. How are the mighty <laughs> During the writing of this book, I read um, this book called Third Culture Kids, called um, TCKs. I think Americans are familiar with this, but I wasn't. Um, and they're defined as people who spent most of their childhood outside their home countries. So, not necessarily refugees or migrants, I mean, they could be like children of the military or whatever. And the third culture is the culture they share between them. And I'm so excited by this book because for the first time that in print, it was like, you know, my experiences were there, were reflected back to me. Um, so I took many of the themes in that book um, as my underlying ones in these poems. And um, he did go on at some length about these unresolved griefs. Uh, uh, so here a pair of songs uh, about that. Background music. You may be in a cafe reading when, after the intro, Billy Holiday and Easy Living lure you out of Walden and swing you in a trance out of the cafe. You may be watching Sean Evans as Mills, mostly to marvel at the mimicry of his body language, so like John Thor's, when you're torn away, this time by Puccini, away from the spires of Oxford to fall, to fall as Tosca falls, defences fall, that your heart breaks open a dungeon door, and griefs like prisoners crouched on the floor bestir themselves, and infant griefs like dolls sleep through a bell that tolls and tolls and tolls. Music, being as wordless as they are, these frozen griefs no trauma ever thought, these griefs that thought goodbye was au revoir, and thought the dead were living still abroad, these unnamed griefs forgotten in a wasteland where who and what and why have long dissolved, seems, once brought to the fore, to understand griefs neither time nor rhyme no love resolved. It's left to dreams of dull bewilderment, when wrong and right change places without cause, while witnesses and God seem not to notice, to dredge up feelings of abandonment, the day's debris, for you alone to witness, a flood of shame that out of shame withdraws. Um, 
There's a, another Farsi word in this poem, which is the title poem, Chohor Gomok. That literally means four gardens. So it's like the um, model of the garden paradise, um, intersected by four rivers or four paths. Afterwardness. An 11-year-old boy from Aleppo, whose eyes hold only things no longer there, a citadel, a moat, safe rooms of shadow, afterwardness in his thousand-yard stare, years later, decades even, might turn around to see through the long tunnel of that gaze, a yard, a pond, and pine trees that surround, as in a charred bog, four branching pathways. Where do memories hide? The pine trees sing. In language, of course, the four pathways reply. What if the words be lost? The pine trees sigh. Lost, the echo comes. Lost like me and air. Then sing the pathway's answer. Sigh and sing for the echo, for nothing, no one, nowhere. It's my privilege, honestly, to read a poem um, celebrating Carcanet. From Bridget Pegeen Kelly. This is one of my favourite books ever, ever, from actually any press, not just Cockland. Um, Sun and the Orchard. Two books. And uh, hopefully, this is a bit longer. <laughs> Black Swan. I told the boy. I found him under a bush. What was the harm? I told him he was sleeping and that a black swan slept beside him. The swan's feathers hot, the scent of the hot feathers and of the bushes' hot white flowers as rank and sweet as the stewed milk of a goat. The bush was in a strange garden a place so old it seemed to exist outside of time. In one spot, great stone steps leading nowhere. In another, statues of horsemen posting giant stone horses along a high wall. And here were triangular beds of flowers flush with red flowers. And there, circular beds flush with white. And in every bush and bed flew small birds and the cries of small birds. I told the boy I looked for him a long time. And when I found him, I watched him sleeping. His arm around the swan's moist neck. The swan's head tucked fast behind the boy's back. The feathered breast and the bare breast breathing as one. And then very sweet and without making a sound so that I would not wake the sleeping bird, I picked the boy up and slipped him into my belly, the way one might slip something stolen into a purse, and brought him here. And so it was, and so it was, a child with skin so white it was not like the skin of a boy at all, but like the skin of a newborn rabbit, or like the skin of a lily, pulseless and thin, and a giant bird with burning feathers, and beyond them both, a pond of incredible blackness, overarched with ancient trees and patterned with shifting shades, the small wind of the branches making a sound like the knocking of a thousand wooden bells. Things of such beauty. But still, I might have forgotten, had not the boy, who stands now to my waist, 
his hair a cap of shining feathers. Come to me today weeping, because some older boys had taunted him and torn his new coat. Had he not, when I bent my head to his head, said softly, but with great anger, I wish I had never been born. I wish I were back under the bush, which made the old garden rise up again, shadowed and more strange. Small birds running fast, and the grapple of chill coming on. There was the pond, half circled with trees, and there the flowerless bush. But there was no swan, there was no black swan. And beneath the sound of the wind, I could hear, dark and low, the giant stone hooves of the horses, striking and striking the hardening ground. If you have not read this book, please read it. Oh God, I can't follow that now, can I? <laughs> Impossible. Um, but I will follow it with um, another boy poem, and this boy is my own son, who has had mental illness, schizophrenia, since he was 20-something, but he's now God, middle-aged, you know, and doing very well, so um, this is just called The Boy. The boy would always wear his coat indoors, a long black cashmere, threadbare now and fraying. He'd prop a folding magnifying mirror, as though to shave before he started playing, on top of the piano, tilts its face towards his own, then bundles on a stool, still in his hat and coat, burning to traces double, like Narcissus at the pool, lean and stare in the glass, just stare, deaf mute to, don't you want to take your coat off, darling? Numb to the keyboard, pressed against his knee. Time made no sense to him. Minute by minute, silent as time without him in it would be, the boy, who was a man, sat fiercely staring. There's poems all in the earlier part of the book. And I'll just finish with two or three or something from later on. Um, well, since there's so many uh, poets in the audience, I'm sure some of you have experienced that thing where at night when you're asleep in your dreams, you write this amazing poem. Oh, I hope I can see it. It's not <laughs> Wake up, is it really gone? <laughs> um, so this is called Night Writing. Poetry startles me awake last night. Stray lines, excited to be up so late, streaked into view, then melted out of sight, in light without the lights on, grey and slate. I listened, looked, half blind, half animal. Cool air in a thrown draught ruffled my fur. I was a blind old tabby, dazed, forgetful, letting the lines like mice race by the sofa. <clears throat> Even in bed, Proust caught them by the tail, patted them back and forth from claws to claws till all the truths drained out of them and lay pooled on the page. But my dim wits, my paws, were too illiterate to read their brain. My mice would never see the light of day. And um, just a couple more to lost track of time. Um, I thought uh, going right into coming towards the end of the book, I was getting quite nervous because I Life would be see if it would end. Because you know, I, I think I was thinking it was all linear and I was just going along this straight path. And then it wasn't until I realised actually it was on an arc and the book was going to circle back to the beginning. 
so it comes back to the airport. And um, these are two um, sonnets called Mehrabad Airport, that's in Tehran. They came to see me off, bearing like magi gifts they unloaded from sheds and taxis, war arms and caskets, swords and gladioli, pistachios rattling in cardboard boxes, only to take them home again to rooms where gladioli were returned to vases, glass fronted cabinets hid away heirlooms, samovars endlessly refilled their glasses. What if a heritage were lost on route? In rosebud sheets, roomfuls of furniture were stowed on board, down to a miniature grand piano, also in Limoges porcelain, painted with a fragment of courting scene, a maid and troubadour plucking his lute. There are model airport too. Sometimes you hear of someone dying when you thought they died already years ago. They come to life only to die again. Fad memory can be so cruel. Although close relatives who die abroad but live well past their hundredth birthday in the mind move about in their younger years as active or dependent, can prove it also kind. So here they crowd. In jet black fifties hairdos, pinstripes and polka dots, swing skirts and blouses, siblings who rode and wore chaldors on donkeys, cousins who crouched diminutive in photos, decoraged like Panuk's museum mementos, in cabinets of curiosities. I went with this last poem. Paper trails. Staring up at pure blue from down on earth, we see them shining in the firmament, the jets, the contrails, gliding back and forth like deep sea fish, soundless and innocent. Their exhaust particles and frozen vapors show us graphically cause and effect. In the silver bullet nose jets, the cause. In trails like spinal x rays, the effect. It only takes a trigger, a single flight in childhood, for example, early trauma, to stretch the bare bones of the aftermath into a lyric void beyond the finite and knowable. A via negativa cruising at altitude and plumes of breath. Thank you very much for listening.